And thank you all for being here this afternoon uh, on, on the not as drippy Thursday as it was yesterday. I, so yeah, my, I'm looking at the issue of food security from the perspective of someone who does oceans and coastal law. So this is a slightly different take on food security than normal, but I think it's an important one and there's some very interesting developments going on that could have an impact on both national and international law in the very near future. So just to start off, what do we mean by food security to begin with? Uh, in general, there's, you know, like most things, a lot of different definitions. But in general, food security refers to the state of having secure access to enough food of the right nutrition components, I should throw in there, for a given population at all times. Uh, usually this is a concern of governments and, and uh, depending on what level of government you're dealing with, the, the relevant population can obviously change in size. I'm for the most part going to be looking at national food security level concerns, uh, but regional and local do matter as well. And I will mention in passing but not talk a whole lot about, uh, there are special concerns when you're talking about food security regarding the poor and other vulnerable populations. But again, that's not going to be the main focus of what I look at, although fish for those populations can be very important depending on where exactly you are. So, why do you normally think about food security? What do people worry about when they're worried about food security? Um, they're usually looking at what are the limitations on food security for a given region. Are we importing most of our food? Are we growing most of our food? What limitations do we expect from, say, water availability, arable land, temperature, population changes? And I love Australia because they always throw in radiation. So this is an Australian map that you're seeing. And one of their concerns is radiation contamination. So I, but. This focus is usually on land crops. When you're worried about arable land and fresh water to irrigate, you're talking about land crops. And I think oceans really need to be part of this uh, conversation, and more and more countries around the world are agreeing with me on that, uh, because there is a lot of people's protein, in particular, that comes from fish consumption. And, and I'm going to focus on protein because that tends to be the limiting nutrient for a lot of populations and is one of the better measures of whether the population is actually healthy as opposed to not technically starving. Um, there's a difference between those two things. So uh, of the world's 7 billion people and counting, 1 billion rely on fish, and that includes freshwater fish, as their primary source of protein. So a seventh of the world's population is getting most of their protein, if not all of it, from fish. Three billion get almost 20% of their protein from fish, and 4.3 billion get about 15% of their protein from fish. So over half the world's population is relying significantly on fish to stay healthy uh, for their protein. All right, fish consuming nation, uh, this is pounds per person. I, I'm not worried about the ordering so much as just to show you, this is not anything you can pin to a particular part of the world. It's a worldwide phenomenon. The countries that rely heavily on fish as a major source of food are spread throughout the world. Uh, you get a very different list if you do it in total pounds consumed. China is like way off the chart and ahead of everybody else in pounds, total pounds consumed. But nevertheless, it, it spread throughout the world, uh, concern for fish as an aspect of food security. <clears throat> Nations where fish is a critical source of protein, uh, this is a food and agriculture organization, UN chart. Dark green is where fish consumption is the most critical. Uh, you notice we fall off, we've got lots of other sources of protein in the United States, we lose all our fish. And, tragedy but not going to kill us. Other parts of the world, uh, it's more than a tragedy in terms of loss of the fish. It's a tragedy on a very human scale as well. And I'm going to just point out for future reference, notice that dark green band and slightly lighter green bands running through Africa. Africa is an interesting story on food security when it comes to fish. So just keep that in your memory. All right. 
Uh, source and supply projections. Uh, this is a, another chart from the Food and Agriculture Organization on where we are. So the, the yellow orange in the background is world population, steadily increasing. The chart actually ends in 2002, so even higher than that. Uh, supposedly going to be about 9 billion by 2050 and over 10 billion by the end of the century. So that's going to keep going up. The dotted blue line is wild fish catch. And the important part of that dotted blue line is the very end where it's leveling off and starting to decline. So keep that in mind. Wild fish catch, leveling off, starting to decline. Uh, the solid blue line is everybody but China, more significantly declining. If you take China's stats out of it, which are questionable for a lot of reasons, uh, it's, it's more clearly starting to decline, and that's gotten worse since 2002. Uh, aquaculture is the orange line at the bottom. You know, it's aquaculture increasing dramatically, geometrically, to try and start making up for some of the food gap. And that green line is how much fish is actually available per capita, not rising nearly as fast as it needs to. That's the point of this chart. All right, uh, another kind of projection looking out to 2030. Um, China is by far the leading user of aquaculture in the world at the moment. They're responsible for about 68% of the aquaculture fish in the world, most of which they consume themselves. Uh, but the aquaculture projections are rising steadily into the future. That uh, dark, Black or dark blue is capture fisheries in China. That's the wild fisheries. Uh, the dark blue below it is capture fisheries from everybody else. And those two bars, you notice, are projected to hold steady. That's kind of optimistic that they will hold steady. They will probably decline. They will certainly not get any better or any <coughs> bigger. All right, so what is happening to the wild caught fish? Why is aquaculture on the rise? Why are nations thinking it's important? Uh, this is a kind of complicated chart, but what it shows is that fishing effort around the world has increased. There are bigger boats carrying more fuel with more fuel capacity and bigger nets out there than there have ever been. And some of these nets are pretty incredible. Uh, they can hold, some of them, four to five 747s. Uh, you can drive a 747 right through the opening of the net. They're huge. They're out there. These things burn a lot of fuel, uh, making the effort to catch the fish. And they're not catching any more. They've got sonar to find the fish. They've got the nets to catch anything that crosses their path. And they can't catch more fish which means that the energy effort and the human effort to catch each pound of fish is increasing steadily with no increase in the ability of wild caught fish to aid in food security. And it's costing us more to get less, basically. And the net result of all that, if you follow science at all, and this one made headlines around the world, a bunch of marine scientists extrapolated out from collapsed commercial fisheries. Uh, collapsed commercial fishery is defined as a fishery, commercial fishery that has fished out the species to the point where less than 10% of the stock is left in the ocean. There's some problems with that number. It's usually based on a baseline set somewhere between 1920 and 1940 which is already probably too low a baseline because there's pretty good evidence the fisheries were decimated before that. So this may be 10% of an, a stock that was already reduced by 80%. So, but on the official definition, uh, the number of commercial fisheries around the world are collapsing at an increasing rate. And the projection in science was that by 2053, basically everything would be commercially extinct out of the ocean. Not extinct, extinct. You could go out and find one or two, but not there in numbers enough to fish commercially. Maybe some of them can recover if they're left alone, maybe not, but this is not 
If you're worried it's food security, this is a very dismal projection for relying on wild caught ocean fish. All right, so this is law school. I will throw a little bit of law in, although you will find this is going to be more or less a policy talk, but uh, a little bit of law. So jurisdiction over fisheries. Who has jurisdiction over fisheries? That is largely set by international law, and in particular, the third United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, in close three, uh, which was adopted in 1982, uh, came into force in 1994. Caveat, the United States is not a party to the convention, but we accept its jurisdictional provisions as customary international law, so we consider ourselves bound by them, even though we don't consider ourselves bound by other parts of the treaty. Uh, but the important part for fisheries in the Law of the Sea Convention is that it gave coastal nations the right to claim a 200 mile wide exclusive economic zone. And that was a significant extension of national authority over the oceans. Within that exclusive economic zone, a coastal nation can regulate the fisheries, period. So it gave coastal nations a lot more control over fisheries within their new jurisdictional zones. Now the United States reaction, we actually asserted a 200 mile exclusive economic zone before the treaty was negotiated. Uh, our reaction was to say, nobody else gets to fish in our waters. We basically kicked the rest of the world out of our waters. And then in 1976, adopted the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation Management Act to regulate sort of fisheries in the United States. Other nations took a different tact. Control over the zone meant you could also lease out the rights to fish. And so other nations have said, hey, we don't have the capacity to fish this zone, but we will sell that right to European Union, China, Japan, you guys want to come fish our waters, come fish our waters. So some very different reactions. But that's the international level. The other zone that's important is everything that's left in blue on this map is the high seas. Basic rule for the high seas is freedom of the seas. So unless there's another treaty regime in place, like say tuna, have treaties up the wazoo governing tuna, Unless there's another treaty regime in place, you can fish for whatever you want, wherever you want in the high seas. That's the basic rule under international law. Now, protecting that first 200 miles is not insignificant because most of the fisheries people care about are in those 200 miles. So not a whole lot out in the open ocean that you'd be after, but that's the basic rule for the open ocean. All right. So a little bit of law part two, I told you coastal nations, once they assert their EEZ, they're in charge of regulating the fisheries. This is a study that came out in 2009, uh, very well peer reviewed, assessing how well coastal nations actually do at managing their fisheries. And the important part of this chart is there's very little dark green on it. It's a little bit of light green here and there, Basically, no dark green. So lots of room for improvement in fisheries management throughout the world, including in the United States. And we can talk about that a little bit more if you want. That's not where I want to spend the time. But the basic point is, one reason all those stocks are collapsing is because we haven't been doing a very good job managing it. All right, so I told you we're, we're going to come back to Africa. So Africa is a case study of how past practices have basically eliminated wild caught marine fish as a source of food security, or an entire continent in this case. Uh, this report came out from Greenpeace, there are several reports on the subject, how Africa is feeding Europe. Uh, if you've been watching the news, you probably picked up a story here or there of how various countries around the world are purchasing lands in Africa to grow crops for export back to whatever country purchased the lands. Same going on in the ocean. Uh, and I told you, Africa's got those dark green bands for it. Fish is a very important source of protein for about 400 million Africans. 
uh, to just stay on par per capita. The continent is going to need another 1.6 million tons of fish per year by 2015, less than two years from now. And another 2.6 million tons of fish per year by 2030, just to keep everybody, all the expanding population, at the same level of protein consumption they're at now. Which, if you're also paying attention to the news, you realize is probably not good enough for most of them. Right, for a lot of them, anyway. <clears throat> now, the sad part, the tragic part, is the continent has extensive and productive marine fisheries, or at least they have been productive in the past, but they've been taken over almost entirely by foreign fishers who are overfishing them, dramatically in some cases. And when they're overfishing them, they are not selling them to anyone in Africa. They are selling them for export back home or to other places that can afford to pay for them. And as a result, the entire continent has essentially lost its marine fisheries as a food source. The entire continent. And at the rate they're being overfished, probably the rest of the world is going to soon lose the African marine fisheries as a food source. So if you want a tragic tale, there's the tragic tale. All right. As a result, a whole bunch of nations across the world are officially turning to mariculture, which is aquaculture of the sea. A whole bunch of different types of aquaculture. A lot of it's freshwater. I'm focusing on mariculture, aquaculture of the sea. A whole bunch of countries around the world are consciously and explicitly turning to mariculture as part of their food security planning. Lots of different circumstances, economic, social, environmental, food security, driving this, but it's becoming a worldwide phenomenon. And this is like in the, the last five to ten years in particular. So countries that have officially announced that they are actively pursuing mariculture as a form of food security. Australia, Fiji, Norway, Palau, Papua New Guinea, the Philippines, Saudi Arabia, Spain's Basque country, Turkey, the UK, and especially England, increasingly the United States, and Yemen. Okay? That's a kind of weird cross-section of countries, all right? Uh, what's driving them? Well, England is worried about population. It's looking intensively at how, at how it's using its marine waters, and it's one of the victims of EU overfishing, which is a problem. Sometimes the EU admits that it has, and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but England has recognized that they are a victim of it. One of the things England is looking to do is England is simultaneously pursuing offshore renewable energy in the form of wind farms. And so England is looking at ways to combine the infrastructure for its offshore wind with the infrastructure for offshore mariculture, which could be pretty interesting. Well, watch England, they're, they're doing some pretty interesting stuff with their offshore waters. Uh, you move up the list, Saudi Arabia, why the heck would they be interested in mariculture? Well, they have no water, which means growing more crops in Saudi Arabia or Yemen or Turkey, not all that easy. So they're looking at mariculture as, hey, we've got the Arabian Sea. Maybe we can do fish. So a different motivation. Uh, some of the tropical countries on this list are reacting to the devastation of the coral reefs which are highly protective fish ecosystems, uh, subject to a bewildering array, array of stressors like pollution and overfishing and dynamiting in some cases and tourism. Uh, so some of them are turning to mariculture as a way to supplement the loss of their coral reefs. So a lot of motivations, but the list of countries consciously pursuing mariculture as a national level policy growing. All right, so there's one point you take away from this lecture and remember forever. Mariculture is not all created equal. OK? 
Okay? I cannot say Mariculture are good, Mariculture are bad. I have to ask, what are you doing where and how? Because it matters. What Mariculture you are probably familiar with, if you are familiar with any of it, is coastal salmon aquaculture, coastal salmon mariculture. Usually it's Atlantic salmon, which is basically extinct in the wild. A variety of places with cold waters have put in offshore aquaculture pens. And the pens vary, the concentrations vary, but you've got Norway, you've got British Columbia, uh, you've got the Faroe Islands, you've got Scotland, I could throw in Australia, I could throw in Chile. Pretty common, pretty popular, one of the first offshore aquaculture, mariculture endeavors in the world. And it's also the one that got people worried about the environmental impacts uh, of what mariculture could, be, could mean. And this got cut off a little bit for some reason, but uh, the impacts are significant. Um, the one I'm going to start with is the fish and fish meal. Salmon are carnivores. It means you have to feed them meat. And the meat they usually get fed are ground up anchovies or sardines taken from the wild and the oil that goes with them. And the math doesn't work. If you care about wild fish at all, the math doesn't work. It takes somewhere between 2.6 pounds to 5 pounds of wild fish to grow one pound of farm salmon. You're not helping, okay? Not helping food security, you're not helping the ocean ecosystem, you're not helping. But there's other things too. Uh, anytime you can find animals in an enclosed location, you gotta be worried about disease. It's true on land, it's true on the ocean. Some of these pens have like three million salmon crowded in together. They get dosed with antibiotics. That means you're throwing pharmaceuticals into the open water, it means you're exposing bacteria and other critters that can infect humans and other animals to antibiotics, and they do what bacteria do, they become antibiotic resistant, so that's an issue. Uh, you get um, uh, diseases, salmon are famous, uh, farm salmon are famous for acquiring sea lice, which they're then great at infecting other fish with. So you get that problem. Uh, you get fish that escape, which if your Atlantic salmon are not native to wherever they're being raised, which they're usually not, you've got an introduced species problem, like with any other introduced species problem. If they're being raised where other species of salmon live, you might have an inbreeding problem too, or interbreeding problem, which if you're talking about the Pacific Northwest, where a lot of the runs of salmon are listed under the Endangered Species Act, that gets to be problematic legally as well as biologically. But the biggest problem people worry about with uh, the farm salmon is the fact that they're kept in those pens. Right? I showed you the pictures. Those pens stay in one place with three million salmon swimming around, defecating. All the waste collects right on the same bottom, very small, basically creates mini dead zones, kills the entire bottom ecology. Okay? I'm not big on farm salmon, if that hasn't become clear. <laughs> All right. But there are other forms of aquaculture and mariculture that are good to know about and good for the environment. So new, relatively new, is coral reef aquaculture, mariculture. Technology finally developed, the breeding technology uh, that allows people to grow coral offshore, being used mostly for restoration work, coral restoration work, uh, either because coral got hit with coral bleaching or because they got run over by a cruise ship or whatever. But when you restore coral reefs, you generate fish, one of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. And so that is viewed as a form of food security, mariculture. A little more indirect than some of them, but still works. Plus you get a nice ecosystem back way at it. Other forms of mariculture, shrimp farming. If you didn't know about the evils of salmon aquaculture, you probably knew about the evils of shrimp aquaculture. 
Uh, but the big one with shrimp is that to have shrimp farming, this is mostly in Southeast Asia, you have to destroy usually a lot of mangrove forests. And again, not great for the environment, but also not great for fish because those mangrove forests are the nurseries uh, for a whole bunch of o open ocean species. So you wipe out the mangrove, not only have you destroy the ecosystem itself, you wiped out the next couple generation of wild fish as well. Not good enough, uh, shrimp like salmon are carnivores, which means you're feeding them wild shrimp or wild fish meal to get them growing in the pounds produced to the pounds put in. Not, not as bad as salmon, but still not good for the ocean. So shrimp bad, salmon bad. The new one, the one to watch, uh, is truly open ocean mariculture. And this is where I think the future of mariculture is going. I think it's going to be very interesting legally. I think it's going to be very interesting ecologically. Have it in yellow because it's so new that nobody really knows if it's environmentally benign or not. The claims are that it is. I'll explain why the claims are that it is, but no one really knows. It's that new. So um, the first really big experiment was the Valella Mariculture Experiment. This was off the coast of the Big Island of Hawaii. What's different about it is, well, okay, first of all, it looks weird. Uh, what was different about it is, first of all, it took place in federal waters. This meant it was more than three miles offshore where this thing was put in the water, in 12,000 feet of water. So immediately some of the pollution issues are dissipated. It's not staying still, it's not anchored, it's moving around, it's got a radio tracker on it. It's not staying still, it's in a whole lot of water, so whatever's coming out of the fish can be diluted fairly easily, fairly fast. They're not being fed as much, they're certainly not being medicated as much, uh, it's got 2,005 pound fish in it. It's huge. <laughs> it, you can, if you look carefully, you can kind of see a diver in the background to give you the scale. Uh, kind of over to the right, that, that weird looking shadow is actually a human being. So, kind of gives you the scale. But yeah, they're huge. So anyway, um, this experiment's been going on since 2010. Had to go through some fairly intensive permitting through the state of Hawaii and through the federal government. Uh, and it had some glitches. They lost a couple of them. The radio tracking failed. They got battered by hurricanes, which Hawaii gets. Uh, you know, so sometime you're off to Hawaii and you run into one of these big things, you'll know what it is. Uh, but they, they managed to get the technology down and uh, the company is Blue Ocean. The fish is trademarked as Kampachi, but it's actually a native species. It's the second way they tried to make it environmentally benign. Those fish exist in Hawaiian waters regardless. Now, they, had, they put in 2,000 hatchery raised of these fish. They're basically a form of uh, yellowtail. Um, but if they escape, they're exactly like fish that are already in these waters of Hawaii. So we got the non-native species problem eliminated. Uh, they are fed, when they are fed, high-protein soy meal, not fish meal. So we're not using other fish to feed them. Are they triploids? Triploids? I don't know. Can they reproduce? Yes. So they're not. I will take your word for it. You have, you have surpassed my knowledge of fish biology. <laughs> they can reproduce, yes. All right. I, and um, the first commercial sales uh, started in May of 2012. Uh, the fish are pulled out twice a week. They're only pulled out as demanded. They are sashimi grade, sushi grade fish. They're five to six pounds when they're harvested. They've been featured in New York gourmet extravaganzas. They've been featured in Hawaiian gourmet extravaganzas. And the company, uh, Blue Ocean, is now making a profit. This is the first open ocean mariculture attempt. 
to become profitable. And that's what the fish look like when they're swimming around the core of those cages, all right? Uh, in November 2012, this company and this project was chosen as one of Time Magazine's best innovations. So we'll see. Newest proposal, where I already kind of mentioned, is uh, open ocean mariculture in the Arabian Sea. This is the proposed design for the Arabian Sea. It's anchored, which may make a difference to its environmental impacts. I don't know what fish they're planning on using, but again, that could matter. But the proposal's on the table, and most interesting of all, in October of 2012, Turkey, at a UN Food and Agriculture Organization convention, formally asked the FAO to investigate the possibility of setting up a regime for mariculture in the high seas, those areas beyond national jurisdiction. Once Hawaii had proven you could do it, you could build the structure, set it loose, and track it by radio. It's like, hey, well, why not put it in the high seas? That's going to take some internet, in, interesting international law developments to allow it to happen, uh, I think. But like I said, the basic rule is freedom of the sea is there's nothing preventing it right now. Turkey wanted to go out and launch one of these things in the high seas tomorrow. Legally, it probably could. There's a couple of challenges you could bring, but probably OK. Uh, but if that regime gets developed, think about how we've changed our notion of the high seas. Suddenly, they're farming plots. The entire ocean has become food production facility for humans. So just toss that. But that's, that's in the works. I mean, that's, that's being thought about as we sit here. All right, the all-around best type of mariculture is shellfish mariculture. A lot of different varieties of this. You can do oysters, you can do a whole bunch of different clams, you can do mussels, uh, oyster bags in New England, a whole bunch of different ways to do it too. Mussel rafts in the state of Washington. Uh, this is clam mariculture in Virginia, the more traditional method of planting them in the beds. And then my personal favorite is the giant clam mariculture. Uh, that occurs in the Solomon Islands, mostly for ecosystem uh, restoration, but you can also eat the things. Uh, but a lot of different types of bivalve shellfish mariculture, and why they're great is that shellfish eat plankton. You basically put them in the water, they feed themselves. You don't have to feed them. You don't dose them with antibiotics. They clean up the water. Water quality improves anywhere you have a sizable shellfish farming operation. They clean up the nutrients. Now, if they start cleaning up toxics as well, they can become a, in a, inedible. Uh, they're actually good at that, but good for water quality, not good if you're trying to produce some food. But no, look, they clean up the water. For reasons that are poorly understand, understood, they also promote ecosystem restoration. Fish and other species start coming back around these mariculture shellfish operations. So, like I said, nobody's quite sure. They don't exactly create habitat, but they do clean up the water column. So who knows? Uh, but for the price of some plankton, you get some very good protein out of these operations. They're relatively fast growing. Um, and a net gain in food. If you're looking at this from a food security perspective, they're a net gain. If you're looking at this from an environmental perspective, they're a net gain. Uh, how much does it cost? Relatively cheap once you once the technology has been developed to get the, the shellfish to breed successfully in, in the hatchery. Relatively cheap. That's, I mean, that's the key for all mariculture operations of getting the species to successfully reproduce. Well, I but I know oysters are pretty expensive, so but, you know, in terms of at the market. In terms of the market, there's a good profit margin um, right now. And, and oysters didn't used to be expensive. That's one of the ironies of the development of fisheries in the United States. Uh, New York City used to be known as the big oyster, and oysters are what the poor ate. So they shouldn't be expensive, and they weren't. But 
Uh, in terms of easy profit margin, like so once you get the technology down, it's, it's, it's one of the better ones. Giant clams took forever to figure out how to get them to grow. But once they did, it's been wonderful. So, all right, so they're good, but they're also rather uniquely the victims of climate change's evil twin, which is ocean acidification. And uh, ocean acidification happens because the oceans are the world's biggest carbon dioxide sink. When they absorb carbon dioxide, and I'm grossly oversimplifying the chemistry for those of you who know that, I know it too, okay? But <laughs> basically, the ocean uh, turns uh, the carbon dioxide into carbonic acid. Oceans are naturally basic, uh, on average somewhere between a pH of 8.2 and 8.4. 7 is neutral, less than 7 is acidic. Uh, worldwide, on average, the ocean pH has already dropped by 0.1 pH units. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's the whole ocean's been changed, first of all. pH is on a logarithmic scale, so a little tiny change is a big effect. And biochemistry is incredibly sensitive on top of that, so for comparison, if your blood pH changed by 0.02 pH units, one-fifth the amount the oceans have changed, you'd be comatose. So keep that in mind. It's a big change for the oceans. Some places worse than others. It's without all things involved in climate change, some places are getting hit worse than others. But on average, 0.1 pH units. Why does that matter? Shellfish in particular are very sensitive to pH. They have trouble forming their shells or attaching to their shells if the pH changes. And that is being observed uh, in the wild and in mariculture. So this was a projection done on the possible impact to wild fisheries from ocean acidification for the United States. Uh, $4 billion loss per year because of the dependence of commercial fisheries on the species that are sensitive to ocean acidification, plus the direct fishing of those species. Equally a problem for mariculture, if you're doing shellfish mariculture, you need to be worried about ocean acidification because it can destroy your product. So three examples and then I'll, I'll stop uh, very quickly. Puget Sound now has the cor most corrosive seawater in the world. Uh, it got Hit with a double whammy, changes in currents and wind patterns, cause an upwelling current to form that brings up incredibly acidic water from the bottom of the ocean and dumps it in Puget Sound. Plus, it's got nutrient runoff problems like most urban coastlines do, and that also contributes to ocean acidification. So it hit the uh, shell, uh, robust shellfish mariculture industry there hard in 2005, the hatcheries were having billions, with a B, of their larvae die overnight. And it took them a while to figure out that it was because these really acidic waters were just being flushed into their system. So Washington, just in November, has a whole task force executive order trying to deal with this, primarily trying to get rid of nutrient runoff and reducing carbon dioxide emissions, because that's what you need to get to to get to this. But they also have a warning system for the upwelling so that the hatcheries can close their intakes and not get that really acidic water coming in. All right, Oregon, same thing. Uh, the uh, Whiskey Creek shellfish hatchery had existed for over 30 years. It was a well-established oyster hatchery. It supplied oyster larvae all over the world. 2008, the workers come in. Oyster larvae dead in all 40 of their tanks overnight. And the same thing turned out to be the acidic upwelling current coming in. Killing them off. Uh, they've gotten back with a warning system and intensive water quality monitoring. Gotten back to about 65 to 75% of normal. They got wiped out in 2008. But this is still a problem for them. Okay, closer to Vermont, Remain has a slightly different problem. The acid mud, or dead muds, or toxic mud, you'll see all three labels. Uh, same kind of confluence, current changes plus nutrient runoff. 
The muds in Maine have gone down in some places to a pH of 6.8 or 6.9. And for people that were doing mud clamming mariculture, we plant the larvae in the mud. Basically, you put a clam larvae in one of these mods, it dissolves in 24 hours. So, they're getting hit. All right, so what can you do? Support shellfish mariculture wherever you can. Don't buy aquacultures salmon and shrimp, and that's going to get me in trouble with someone, but bad, bad, bad. Uh, watch your wild seafood consumption practices. Uh, buy relatively local now. I was very pleased when I got here. This is a local banquet. You guys actually have a real local supply from Boston. So that was pretty cool. Buy local when you can and, and eat down the food chain. Uh, eat herbivores, not carnivores. Get the Monterey Bay Aquariums app if you care, so you can see if we watch. I like them the best because they update the most often. So most likely to be the most accurate. There are other ones that are good, but they also have an app, which is pretty cool. And support the grocers that are promoting sustainable seafood on a national level at Toll Foods and Safeway are the two chains that have seriously committed to sustainable seafood. Obviously local, you get different responses. All right, this is one more reason in a long line of reasons why states and gas, possibly Congress, should get serious about nutrient runoff. A whole lot of reasons why they should do it. This is just to care about food security, get the nutrients out of the water, life would be much better. And insist that the U.S. get serious about addressing carbon dioxide emissions, which I wrote before President Obama's speech on Tuesday, so if you like the speech, be in support of it, I, among other, many other things that would help with this issue. So I'll stop there and open it up for some questions. I mentioned the fish that was used in the uh, Hawaiian open sea mariculture thing. Mm -hmm. um, was it patented? Trademarked. The trademark. Yeah, the name was trademarked. Oh, okay. So they didn't change the genetics. It's a naturally occurring fish, but yeah, they trademarked the names for marketing purposes. So that you knew that these fish came from blue ocean. Yes? How has permitting and regulation of mariculture traced? What is similar about that process and what is different as compared to regulating Okay. You know, there's a process in different parts of the world, in our own country. How are those alike and how are those different? Okay, well, in the United States, there's two possible levels of, of regulation. So if the mariculture is occurring within the first three miles of ocean water, which most of it has been up until recently, you're in state waters, which means the state has primary authority to regulate what's allowed, what's not allowed. And some states addressed it explicitly, especially if they've got a coastal zone management plan, which is kind of land use for the oceans. Uh, some states don't. Some states, like all things, had to scramble when people suddenly wanted to start mariculture operations to figure out how they wanted to regulate them. So a lot of variety at the state level. At the federal level, um, you can be dealing with the Clean Water Act with these operations. Uh, the Clean Water, Federal Clean Water Act has, does apply in the ocean, which I like to remind people of, does apply in the oceans. Uh, and if you have a normal industrial discharge, which a lot of these will, you might just kick in under normal regulations under the Clean Water Act. Where the Clean Water Act gets complicated is it has special provisions for concentrated aquatic animal production facilities, which is an unpronounceable acronym. acronym. And the regulations for those are kind of Byzantine, but there's a whole lot of requirements you have to meet to qualify as one, one of which is you're doing something to recycle the feed. So not a whole lot of facilities actually meet those requirements, but if you do, then you're regulated in the ocean, kind of like CAFAs are regulated on land. That doesn't kick in very often. How do other places deal with it? it? Ranges to not at all, go ahead, go for it, put it in, to 
Uh, no, we're going to be very careful about this. Um, we're concerned about the impacts it will have. I mean, it's like regulation of any natural resource over the, the course of the world. You're going to see the whole gamut. So. It's growing in freshwater aquaculture. It hasn't been tried, to the best of my knowledge, in ocean aquaculture yet, because ocean aquaculture is just kind of new in, in general. We have multi-species freshwater aquaculture. It's got a long tradition. China's been doing it for uh, millennia, literally. <laughs> uh, China, the Chinese have been long ago developed a four-species system, where the, the four fish they use, and I never remember what well, four are. One of them's carp. Um, exist in different ecological niches and they basically clean up after each other. Uh, so there's some experiments that way. There's some good experiments with tilapia and catfish in the United States uh, where you're also farming seaweed or some sort of plant and you can get that cycle going well. But like I said, to the best of my knowledge, no one's tried it in the oceans yet. John? So what happens if you have one of these open ocean Balls that's raising fish and uh, it's following the currents, let's say, and then it goes into the 200 mile uh, boundary for the, for the country. What happens at that point? Does, that, does anything happen or does that trigger some type of a event? Um, no, it's a short answer. Uh, if it did, you would be into the wonderful world of what counts as capture of a fish because the, the rule of capture is the baseline rule for fish in the high seas. Um, if you caught it, it's yours. If it's swimming free, it's not, which should ring some bells with first year property. But uh, what counts as capture historically has differed from species to species. So there are different rules for sperm whales than there were for right whales, for example. I suspect that fish successfully captured in a plastic structure that could be tracked and retrieved would count as being captured, but I can, I can see a different argument. If you've lost control of the ball, maybe you've lost control of the fish too. I, you know. But that, that would be the legal analysis that would apply in the absence of some regime that hasn't been thought up yet. One more question? I'm Has sure. the, the uh, carbon footprint of bringing the Hawaiian fish to New York for the special events been taken into account? Uh, in terms of marketing it as sustainable, taken into account how? I mean, I, I, from, from a, completely, a, a fish perspective, it seems fantastic, but I mean, if you're also flying halfway across the globe to, to bring those specific fish, in the grand scheme of things, how much of an offset is that really? Well, okay, here, here's some interesting factoid for you. The United States imports 90% of the wild fish sold commercially in the United States. We also export 90% of the wild fish we catch, so we're net even, but in terms of carbon footprint, we're completely out of whack. How much worse this is than anything else we do, I don't know, so I say compared to what? Um, that, was, that event was a marketing event, so how often New York is going to be importing these fish, I don't know. They're mostly for the local marketing, uh, local Hawaiian markets right now, so it's not the bulk of their sales by anywhere close to a stretch of imagination at this point. So I would say overall they're probably pretty low carbon footprint now. But if you want to start talking carbon footprint in fisheries, Flying in New York is only the start of it, because then you got to look at boat fuel, ship fuel, processing expenses, processing fuels. It gets pretty heavy pretty fast. All right. 